Welcome, everyone, and thank you. Thank you so very much for joining us here today. I sincerely hope you find today's topic as fascinating as we do. My name is Michael Steinberger, and I am founder and CEO of Jewish Heritage Alliance, a platform dedicated to promoting the Sephardic experience. For those of you who may not know, the word Sephardic in Hebrew literally means Spain, but in historical context, Sephardic refers to the Jews of the Iberian Peninsula, nowadays Spain and Portugal. The story of Sephardic is a far-reaching story with endless twists and turns and profound consequences. With the exception of a relatively brief period we call the Golden Age, a time when the Jews were able to live and thrive under the Moors of North Africa, who conquered and ruled Southern Spain, by and large, this was a tumultuous and turbulent period for the Jews of Sepharad, experiencing oppression, persecution, pogroms, and forced conversions. These forced conversions created the crypto-Jewish phenomena, which we will be discussing here today. But for all of its significance and relevance, the story of Sepharad seems to lack the attention it truly deserves. This is why we started Jewish Heritage Alliance with a mission to capture and promote the story of Sepharad on a global scale. To accomplish this ambitious mission, the Alliance allows us to expand our reach and broaden our scope, creating a voice of the collective as we are doing here today. So at this time, I would like to thank our co-hosting partners for helping us make this event a success. I would like to thank David Hatchwell, president of the Fundacion Hispano Judaya or the Hispanic Jewish Foundation. I also would like to thank Shulamit Bahat, chief representative in North America of Anu Museum, the Jewish people, previously Beit Fusot. I'd like to thank Jason Guberman, executive director of Jewish Sephardi Federation and its Institute of Jewish Experience. I would like to thank Ruth Gavajo, founder of Centro Estudios Judaicos de Estudios de Montes. I'd like to thank Avi Tawil, director of European Jewish Community Center. I also like to thank Ari Goldstein, senior public programs producer at Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I also like to thank Avram Grohl, executive director of Jewish Gen, and also like to thank Professor Dr. Chaim Shaked, director Miller Center of Contemporary Judaic Studies, the Feldenkrais Programs of Judaic Studies of University of Miami. A very special thank you to Yaakov Agoel, chairman of the executive of World Zionist Organization for his support and acknowledgement. This is the first in a series of webinars paying homage to the women of Sepharad who played a pivotal role in keeping Jewish tradition alive. We are honored to have Professor Rene Levine Malamed as our guest speaker, who is considered the leading academic authority on this subject. At this time, I'd like to call Mr. David Hatchwell of the Fundacion Hispano Judaya for his opening remarks. Thank you, David. Thank you so much, Michael. It really is a pleasure and an honor to be part of this webinar where we're going to be touching base on a series of historical facts that need to be shown to the world. And I'm happy to do that on behalf of the Fundacion Hispano Judea. And in this uh, alliance that we share with the Jewish Heritage Alliance, this is one of the events that we are partaking together um, in a way that uh, will show uh, how the new Sepharad is about. We are a young foundation, only five years old, but on the other hand, we've uh, established a set of goals that are important to establish uh, an international Hispanic Jewish museum in Madrid with a set of alliances all over the world. So we have set uh, important and ambitious objectives and we're very happy to do that in an alliance form. So here's to what we're going to be discovering today. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, David. And now I'd like to present Mrs. Shulamit Bahat of Anu Museum of the Jewish People for her opening remarks and to introduce today's short but moving video. Thank you, Michael, for initiating this series and for gathering all these uh, important partners. It is a testimony to the importance of the story of the Jewish women of Sepharad. The Museum of the Jewish People was founded as Beta Tfutzot, the Diaspora Museum. The Tel Aviv-based entity is active globally and is dedicated to tell the entire illuminating story of the Jewish people. 
We, you and I, are part all of this story. As the story continues to evolve, the museum is totally transformed and open to the public last Tuesday. With the new museum, the largest of its kind in the world, came a new name, Anu, Museum of the Jewish People. Anu, we in Hebrew, is a name that reflects the re-envisioning of the Jewish narrative that embraces our uniqueness, guards our ethos and heritage, celebrates our unity and diversity, presents the many threads of our experience and enhances our identity and sense of belonging that transcends time and place. The dedication to the tradition that our ancestors adhere to links every generation to the next. The story of the Jews who lived in Safarad for centuries and were expelled, forced to flee their homes or convert was part of my family legacy. As was the dark chapter of the Shoah, my mother's ancestors fled from Portugal and generations later settled in Belarus. In my father's shtetl in Poland, families by the names of Baranel, Yabetz, were among leaders of the community. Engulfed with this mystery, their stories touched my heart and imagination since childhood. Bechol dor vador, chayav adam lirot et atzmo, in every generation, we must see ourselves as if we left Egypt, as if we were forced to flee and hide. This is how I feel every Passover when I hold the Sarajevo Haggadah and felt when I watched the new animated film you are about to see, it is an integral and central part of the comprehensive story told at Anu, Museum of the Jewish People. It is my story, and it is yours. Yeshua, that was amazing. And now allow me to introduce Mr. Yaakov Agoel, the chairman of the executive of the World Zionist Organization, who was kind enough to send us a recorded message for this event. Shalom lekulam, kan mibirata nitzchit shel medinat Yisrael va'am ha'yehudi Yerushalayim. Bilzuni levarech et ilgun brit ha'moreshet ha'yehudit al aknasim שאתם מקיימים במטרה להעלות את המודעות לשימור המורשת של גירוש יהודי ספרד והנחלתו לכלל הציבור בכלל ואת חלקן ומעורבותן של אנשים בשימור מורשת חשובה זו. 
אחת הנשים הראויה לציון בעשייתה הציונית היא אנרייטה סולד, מחנכת ופעילה ציונית שעמדה בראש ארגון עליית הנוער אשר נועד להצלת נוער יהודי מאירופה והכשרתו לחיי עבודה וחקלאות וקליטתו כאן בארץ ישראל. כמו כן היא הייתה ממקימות ארגון נשות הדסה ועמדה ברשות הארגון הזה בשנותיו הראשונות. אני מציע ללמוד את דמותה, לחלום ולהגשים את החלומות. כידוע ההיסטוריה העולמית לוקה בהמון חסר ידע בנושא זה ואי לכך המורשת שאתם מנחילים לדורות הבאים חשובה מאין כמותה ולכן אתם ראויים להכרה והוקרה. אני שמח בהזדמנות זו לחזק את ידיו של המנכ״ל של ברית המורשת היהודית מי, מייקל שטיינברגר וידוע לי כי עצם העובדה שמייקל נולד כאן בארץ אך גדל בתפוצות חיזקה אצלו את המחויבות לחקר המורשת היהודית. מייקל הוא אדם שמקדיש את חייו ומרצו לטובה לקידום חקר החלק הזה בהיסטוריה שסובל לאורך השנים מהזנחה במחקר. אני גאה שאנו כהסתדרות הציונית העולמית הפועלת בקרב כל הקהילות היהודיות ברחבי התפוצות זוכים היום להיות מארחים שלכם יחד עם גופים נוספים ומברכים ופועלים בזירה הבינלאומית. כידוע ההסתדרות הציונית העולמית פועלת כבר מעל 120 שנה עוד מאז הקונגרס הציוני הראשון בבאזל לטובת חיבור העם היהודי והתפוצות לארץ ישראל ולעם ישראל. ההסתדרות הציונית עובדת לילות כימים לטובת חיזוק הזהות היהודית בתפוצות על ידי מגוון פרויקטים שונים כגון אולפנים ללימוד עברית, שליחים בכל העולם, מאבק באנטישמיות והעלאת הזהות היהודית. אנו מקש... מנסים לקשר את הקהילות בתפוצות לארץ ישראל. מגוון כנסים הנלחמים בתופעת האנטישמיות ועוד דברים רבים אחרים. אני שולח לכם שוב ברכה חמה, כאן מירושלים, עיר הקודש, עם ישראל חי. I would like to call on Professor Judith Baskin, who will kindly introduce our guest speaker. Take it away, Judith. Professor Rene Melamed of the Schechter Institute of Jewish Studies in Jerusalem received her doctorate from Brandeis University. She is the author of three books and the editor of a fourth. And for the past 22 years, she has been the academic editor of Nashim, a journal of women's studies and gender issues. She has written many important scholarly articles and book chapters on a range of topics connected to Sephardi women in the Middle Ages and early modern period, as well as about the medieval Jewish women whose lives are reflected in the documents of the Cairo Geniza. Professor Levine Melamed's first book Heretics or Daughters of Israel, the Crypto-Jewish Women of Castile, received two National Jewish Book Awards. Her third book, An Ode to Salonika, celebrates the life and Ladino poetry of Buena Sarfati, a World War II partisan who risked her life many times to aid her community. Levine Melamed's volume poignantly demonstrates how Sarfati's poems detail the life and the destruction of Salonika, once one of the world's most vibrant Sephardi Jewish communities. I first became a colleague and friend of Professor Levine Melamed when I was privileged to include her pioneering chapter Sephardi Women in the Medieval and Early Modern Periods in my 1991 edited collection, Jewish Women in Historical Perspective. It is my honor to introduce this outstanding scholar to you today. Thank you, Judith. Um, have to smile. <laughs> Okay, um, what I'd like to do is tell you how I'm going to work this. 
uh, this, I say evening, I'm in Jerusalem, it's 9 p.m. Um, the, I will make first some comments about crypto Judaism. I will not have time to go into great detail about it, but just in order so that you understand what we're talking about. Uh, then with the help of Nathan, I will show you um, just a few uh, pictures or photos of original inquisition documents so that you could see uh, from whence my material came from. We will not read them or go over them, but just a, a few, so you can see the handwriting, you could see what, what one deals with. Uh, and then the, the rest of my time I will spend on describing various observances, which I found in, uh, in inquisition documents uh, in the Archivo Historico Nacional in Madrid. Uh, so first some comments about what is class, what is crypto Judaism? The word crypto gives, us, gives it away. It's hidden, it's clandestine. And any clandestine religion has to be different from a religion as we know it, from a normative religion. Uh, a clandestine religion is also noted for two things, which I will try to point out as I give examples. It's noted for lacuni, for things that disappear and abs are absent, things that could not be done uh, simply because they were too dangerous. For example, you don't go out and build a sukkah during Sukkot because basically you would, uh, once the Inquisition was established, you would be telling them, here I am, come and take me. Uh, and also additions, things that were added that were mistakenly or um, psychologically uh, seen to be part of what Judaism was, uh, and, and as we'll see, they are not part of halachic Judaism or the Judaism of the rabbis, uh, but rather of the, of the religion of, uh, of these secret, secret Jews. Uh, so that's, that's one, of the, um, uh, one, one of the basic things that we need to know about crypto Judaism. I will discuss four. The second one is the framework, the framework in which we are working. Um, from the first forced conversion was in 1391. There were conversions in the beginning of the 15th century uh, in from between 1412, 1416, 18, and, and various also uh, various conversions that were voluntary. And of course, 1492, we have those who chose not, chose not to, to leave Spain. Um, but for the crypto Jew, we have until the establishment of the Inquisition, we have them choosing their paths. But once the Inquisition is established, which is it gets the, the bull, the acceptance of the letter from the, the, the Pope is given in 1478, 1481, they start getting their act together. Uh, and if you quickly do the math, if they start act, uh, um, acting in 1481 and 1492, the Jews are expelled, then this living example of Judaism is gone. There are only 11 years when there are Jews in Spain during the Inquisition. Uh, so there's no more living example after 1492. It's stripped of its leaders, functionaries, whether it be the rabbi, the cantor, the, the mohel, the teachers, the, the shochtim, the slaughterers. Uh, it's, they're, they're not, they don't have literature, the prayer books, bi, uh, Bible, Tanakh, Talmud, Hebrew, etc. Um, so the framework of Judaism is something that is going to be very lacking or almost, almost completely gone. The third characteristic of crypto Judaism uh, is that we have to take into account is the time factor. Uh, as time passes, uh, you're going, you tend to forget. We all forget. Uh, and this is a religion that is going to be transmitted by transmitted orally. It's by memory. And we know that if we play telephone and I start here with Michael and I whisper something in his ear, by the time it gets down to Monica or someone else, it will already, will already have lost something in transition. So just think about things that are being transmitted uh, verbally uh, and in the hopes of going, going from generation to generation. And there'll be things that are going to be, uh, going to be uh, not, not going to be quite what they should be. And the fourth characteristic of crypto Judaism uh, is the threat of the Inquisition. In other words, once we have an Inquisition there, then observance is a completely different game. It's a, you, you, it becomes difficult, it's dangerous, even in the place that one would think is the safest place, our home, that's where we feel safe here. We're all been, after the, during the pandemic, we're safe from, uh, from COVID because we're in our homes. Uh, well, even in your home, if you observe Judaism, you were not safe. 
So it became a tremendous challenge to observe and simultaneously to maintain secrecy. What of the institutions that were existing beforehand, if we don't have any more a synagogue and we don't have any more a Beit Midrash, a study house, and we don't have any more of the, the teachers and the functionaries, the only institution that remains is the family. And so even the home, which is where the family lives, there it does not provide guarantees that this, is, that this is a safe place to observe Judaism. And what, what one discovers in reading these documents is that despite external dangers and internal dangers, these, these crypto Jews who were all baptized, they are legitimately Catholic in the eyes of the church. They are not Jews, they are secret Jews, but they have been baptized at the baptismal fund. fund. Um, but those who we find uh, information about, they have observed and the result that we see is that the woman who was traditionally responsible for maintaining the home, she takes on a much more active role. Uh, we, have, we have women, you can even see in the, um, uh, it, it, you can even see in the charges and the accusations that I will say, to, that I will say about the woman, you were lighting candles, you were keeping the Sabbath, or you were cleaning the house, or you were making, uh, you were making matzah, whereas the men would most of the, most of the time would be, you allowed this to happen. It was much more passive in many ways. You allowed the candles to be lit, you allowed the kosher food uh, to be served. Uh, and we also find that they're active as teachers. The Inquisition starts asking around 1500, asking them, who taught you? because they realized that that's how they could get to the root of what they saw as a problem of heresy. Uh, and the women are much more active in teaching. Okay, so before I go further, I would like to just quickly show you some, uh, before I show you information from the files to look at some of the files that Nathan, Nathan, you got my PowerPoint there? Okay, this is, as I said, it's a cover page so that when I would order documents um, and if I had ordered, Isabel Lopez, who was tried in 1516, she had a two-year trial. Rela Chada means that she was relaxed, that she was found guilty and burned at the stake. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is, this is here, that they have the numbers on the, on the bottom uh, as how, how, they're how they're filed. Okay, and the next one is just another cover page of a woman who was a doctor's wife. So we can also see that we have from um, all different not only poor and wealthy, we'll see in a minute, we'll have a, a cobbler's wife. Um, and, and here we have one from uh, <clears throat> 1531 to 1539. Here is just the genealogy. We don't find it in every file, um, but very often they will start asking them and they will start to tell about who, who their parents were, what their names were, when they were Jewish, where they lived, where they moved, et cetera. And you can see this is a completely different handwriting. Um, also abbreviations galore. These were notaries who, um, uh, especially in the 15th and 16th century, they made up their own sh uh, abbreviations and, and, and sh shortcuts for doing things. Uh, and uh, you know, some of them were also dyslexic, so it's a lot of fun reading, but this is a very pretty handwriting in the genealogy. The next one is a page, uh, I mentioned that we have a cobbler's wife, well, this is Juana Martinez, who was tried in 1530. Again, this is a page that well, would be the second or third page of the file. Uh, which has a lot more information. Proceso contra Juana Martinez, Mojo de Al Al Alvar García Zapatero, Vecina de Alcazar de Consuegro. Consuegra, as you can see then in the bottom, they describe what happens to her uh, so that you can follow along. Uh, the next one, please. All right, here we have the an accusation, and these are the new numbers that they used on the side. You can see one, two, three, four. They're not, they're not Roman numerals, they're, they're the, the notary's numerals, but it's here primeramente, so that's the first one. Uh, and then they go on iten, 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 and, 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 and. Usually it's by what they think is the importance of the activity that was done. Uh, so they will start here with keeping off of the Sabbath. Here they're saying she's wearing uh, clean, clean shirts in honor of the Sabbath, for example, clean blouses. Uh, here we have uh, a list. Okay, the next slide is something that was amazing that no one ever thought about and that existed in these documents. Um, and I, I can't go into detail, but I can just basically say that when the prosecutor brought his witnesses in, the, the witness testimonies in, he had two lists. One list had the names of the, of the 
10, uh, of the witnesses and one had no names. The defendant heard the descriptions given without any names. So when we're talking about trying to disqualify prosecution witnesses, we're talking about a guessing game. And they basically sat in their uh, cells trying to think of anyone who might have had a grudge against them and possibly wanted to uh, inform or tell about something that they had done. Uh, and so here is a list of tachas. That little cross there, that little box with the cross, that's a sign when they guessed correctly. And, and that's what I always looked for first when I went. We have the next page is also some more, uh, some more attempts. And you see there's another little box there, uh, but you actually had to get all of them right. So getting two of them right wasn't enough because you also had to give a, a very good reason as to why they were out to get you and have two witnesses testify to that. Okay, that's another thing that's there. there. Okay, and the last, uh, the, the last one here is uh, Beatriz Rodriguez, who was a midwife. Uh, and she had, you can, her, her trial lasted from 1536 to 1563. She was brought in and out for 27 years because of the fact that she was a midwife. She was doing things that obviously the men of the church were not pleased, pleased about. Certainly if there's a baptism, she might be involved as well. Uh, and I actually thought that she could have done lots of things uh, underhandedly sort of in a secret uh, way, which she may probably didn't, but uh, um, in the end, she's an old woman uh, at the very end and she is not burned at the stake. She's just kept under supervision, but she's basically lost her, uh, her, her, uh, her, her job more or less. And uh, the last one, I'm doing my own quick PR of my book, which Judith helped me choose the cover for. These are, this is perfect for um, before Passover because this is the Hagalat Kelim. This is the women who are taking their, um, their dishes and, and, and into the water to sanctify them before, before Passover so that they can be used here. Um, and as you see, I called it heretics or daughters of Israel because in the eyes of the Inquisition, they were heretics in the eyes of, in our eyes, they were daughters of Israel. Okay, thank you, Nathan. We'll go back to. Okay, so now um, quickly to discuss observances and um, one, what, when we think about it, whatever is easier to remember is going to be the ones that we're going to find more often because that's, again, it's memory. It's memory that's working. The ones that are observed more frequently are the ones that we're going to, we're going to expect to find. And indeed we do because we're talking about basically two categories of observances, observing the Sabbath, it's a weekly observance. So we remember it because every six days it rolls around uh, and it has a, such a prominent role in Judaism. Uh, um, and, and, and of course, uh, keeping the dietary laws, the kashrut is something that's done daily. So these are the two kinds of observances that we do would expect to find most common and we do. Um, they are both cyclic, they are both repetitive, but they are also both more predictable and easier to detect. Uh, and what I will tell you, and just keep this in mind as I talk about these observances, everyone has servants in their home. Everybody has them because you basically just have to have to give them a roof over their head. Uh, and they're, they're simple people who just want food. Uh, and you don't not have servants for, for two reasons. One, it would be too obvious that why you're not having servants. And two, I'm sure that these women said, why should I not have servants and do all the work when I have these people who can do all these work? You know, it would make my life so much harder. Uh, so think about this. Again, another problem when I say keep the home isn't safe because we've got these servants there. Now, they're not built-in witnesses for the, for, the, for the Inquisition. The Inquisition hasn't sent them. But at a certain point, when the Inquisition will, will go around giving explanations of what you might look for, these servants could very easily say, oh, I saw that, and just come and report something they'd seen in a, in a house where they had been working. Okay, so here we have I, some, some descriptions of the Sabbath. I can't say I found anyone who observed it from A to Z, um, but many of the women did prepare for the Sabbath. It was very important for them to prepare for the Sabbath and, and one of the things that we find is that they're bathing. Now for us, of course, we take a hot shower. Some of us are morning showers, some of us are in the evening, you know, or a bath sometimes. It's not a daily occurrence in medieval Spain. This is something that maybe happens once a week. 
And if it's happening once a week and, and it's happening uh, of, of all days on Friday, and how is it happening? We don't have running water. Who's preparing the bath? The servants. So the servant is sent outside to, the, to, to bring in, to bring the water in, to, to warm it up, you know, to prepare it for the master or the mistress of the house. So they automatically knew that, well, they're not doing it on Mondays. They're not doing it on Saturdays because we're going to church on Sunday. They're doing it on Fridays. So this becomes something that's, that, that is easy to detect. Um, cleaning the house, the same thing. When is the house being cleaned? Well, these servants are getting instructions as to when to clean the house. And they're not cleaning them on Monday and Tuesday. They're cleaning them on, usually the house is cleaning on Thursday or Friday. Uh, baking challah, some women, it sort of falls by the wayside, but in the early period, we find some of them trying to bake challah, removing a piece of dough halakhically. And if someone came in and said, what are you doing? They would make up excuses like, oh, um, this is, I'm going to make cookies for the children. Or, um, you know, they'd say, where did that piece of dough go? Oh, you know, oh, I, just, I need it for some, some, something else. They are preparing food in advance because they do not want to be cooking on the Sabbath. Um, they are replacing, and we, we don't, we have to think about um, candles. There aren't wax. This is something more modern. Well, we have oil lamps. And how does an oil lamp work? Well, it has a wick in it and the wick burns down. Now on a normal evening, the, when um, the mistress would go to, go to bed, she would have whatever, whoever is in charge of it, usually it was some maidservant who was in charge of putting out that wick because then they'd relight it the next day. And when it burned out, they put a new wick in. So these servants were noticing that either I was being asked to replace a wick. Some of them wanted clean wicks every day. Those were the ones who, uh, who were, let's say, that some of the stingier ones were hanging on to their wicks and, and trying to use it, have it and have it clean, but replacing it. And it was also very suspicious if every single night uh, the, the, the mistress would give an instruction uh, to, to, okay, shut it, you know, please put it out. And then all of a sudden on Friday night, she'd say, no, 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 it's all right. I'll stay up a little longer or whatever. And she lets it burn out. Again, these were ignorant or not ignorant, but uneducated servants, but they were, they observed things. They weren't, they weren't blind. They saw also these things were happening time and time again. Um, so these things became suspicious. Uh, and I mentioned that, that wearing uh, of clean or new clothes um, or good clothes, well, people did not have a wardrobe like we do thing, you know, what am I going to wear and, and today, tomorrow, whatever. We, they would have sometimes something they wore the entire week and then something that would be for, dre for dressing up uh, so that it was very noticeable when on Saturday, the, these families would be walking around in these either, if it were just clean clothes, versus what the clothes that they wore on a daily basis um, or their good or their good clothes. And also how do those clothes get clean? We don't have washing machines. The washer is a servant and the servant knows that she's being told when to have at least a blouse. It was the minimum was to have a clean blouse for the women and the men in the family. And so she's being, being, being instructed when to wash it. Uh, and what I remember reading a file about one a servant who, who explained that I would wash this, this better blouse on Tuesdays. And on Wednesdays, I would put it out on the rock to dry. And on Thursdays, I would iron it. And I was trying to figure out how on earth is she ironing it? And then I realized that she basically had a stone that, was, that, that they had uh, made smooth and she put it out in the sun and she was ironing it outside so that it would look be nice uh, for, for, for the Sabbath. So again, all these things are, it's impossible not to have anybody see what you're doing or know what you're doing because there's someone in your house who's working there and working for you. Blessing of children. I found very few examples in the early years. Um, praying is very interesting. There are some prayers that got carried over, some prayers that were translated, some prayers that were made up. Um, but the most interesting thing for me uh, because I sort of am a semi-linguist, is that a word was made up, a word was created about, about praying on the Sabbath. In other words, in Spanish, if you look in, and actually I'm laughing because my laptop computer is right now sitting on my medieval Spanish dictionary, um, which if you opened it up, you would find sabadear. 
and you can hear sabado, which is the Sabbath in Spanish. Sabadear is for the Christian who was walking by, for the for the non for the Christian of uh, who, who did not have any Jewish heritage, who would walk by the synagogue, he would see the Jews praying. Now they were praying; they were actually praying on the Amida, where they're standing up, and there where you where you have the portion during the there where you uh, you sort of rock and you sway with your knees. They thought that this was what, how you prayed on the Saturday on Saturdays. They did not know that this was part of every single. Shacharit, Mincha, and Aravit service. And for them, this word was Sabadeando, was observing, praying on the Sabbath. So there'll be description uh, there as well. Uh, also, obviously, the Sabbath, not working, uh, doing menial tasks. Some we have women who would, um, who, who would sit next to their spinning wheel uh, and wouldn't work unless someone would come in and pay for someone who was not a Judaizer. A Judaizer is a crypto Jew um, and, and not a Judaizer. And they'd start spinning and then they would stop. Um, I think that one of the most moving files I ever saw was about a woman who had three daughters. And one of her daughters, um, the youngest one, was, um, say, she was... Uh, mentally not of the same level as her sisters. And her mother was afraid to tell her about Sabbath observance and about that they were Jew Jews. And every, every Shabbat, she would take the two older girls to her sisters and they would walk out with their embroidery in their hands. Uh, and she'd leave her alone, which in retrospect was a mistake because she obviously felt bad. She was jealous. She didn't understand, you know, why are they leaving me? But what she did notice is that when they came back, they had not progressed at all in their work. And she's brought in for questioning to the Inquisition. And this was enough to actually, you know, to, for them to learn the, about the Sabbath observance of, of her mother and her, sis, and her, and her sisters. Uh, so there are, there are some women who claim that they had arm, uh, their arms were uh, aching them. And, and the servant would say, how interesting, every Saturday her arms would ache her. On Sunday and Monday, she was fine again. Uh, so we have these you know, serious attempts to observe the Sabbath. Uh, of course, there's the, in the meals. We have many stews being made, chulins, adafinas, um, sometimes uh, the tfina, which in Moroccans make. Um, you, we have, uh, at least are, they don't call them chulin, we, you know, the Ashkenazi chulin. Uh, and I found recipes which, um, um, uh, which were used in the, the Sephardi cookbook, uh, that is well known from, they were in my dissertation, I found various recipes, some were meat, some were fish, some were dairy, all kinds of interesting combinations, uh, but uh, you, we, we, do, we do find them. Um, now, keeping kosher uh, is again dangerous because the servants are around. We do find that before 1492, they were sometimes buying meat from the Jews to get kosher meat from the Jews. Um, women are women are slaughtering birds. Almost everybody has chickens and birds in their outside in the, in the courtyard, and we have women who are, are not thinking twice about slaughtering them. Uh, we have them koshering the meat, removing the nerve from the rear portion, removing the fat from the meat, um, and extensive excuses to cover for this because. They're going into the kitchen, and then you have each of the maid servants has a job. Some of them are kitchen servants, some of them are more house servants, whatever, and the kitchen servants, they would, they would be sent to buy the meat, and then they would come back home and bring it, and they would either be sent out on, a, on some kind of errand, so they wouldn't be around when, the, when they were doing the kashering um, of the meat, um, uh, or they would often say, you know, I don't understand, I brought in this beautiful fatty uh, meat, and now it's just so lean and pathetic looking, uh, and the women would try to conceal this. They would say things like, uh, you know, well, I need it for medicine or, or the cat came in and got it, and, you know, and ate, ate the meat. Uh, and some of them even had health reasons, which was interesting because I learned the word in Spanish for gout. Uh, and, in, and those who do suffer from gout know that you should have a low fat diet. So they would say, the, this is why we had to take the fat off because my husband suffers from gout. Um, uh, now, Anyone who's been to Spain knows, at least it's gotten better, but in the old days, trying to keep kosher was, was very difficult. And trying, and the amount of um, non-kosher uh, foods they eat is just you know, an endless list. 
and here we have these Judaizers trying to refrain from eating pork, which is in, you know, we've got lard, we've got, we've got it in, in millions of forms, refrain from eating rabbits, dead and drowned birds, and unkosher fish, I mean, whether it be eels or octopus, et cetera. Um, what I think I found most interesting were that there were some families that, that had two sets of dishes. Now, do not expect anybody to have two sets of dishes like we're used to for meat and milk under no circumstance, because that would basically be saying, aha, uh, you know, this is, this is, we're keeping a kosher home. But what they did was extremely interesting. They would have sets of dishes for food that had been in touch with pork products and food that had not been in touch with pork products, food that had been, that if had lard or did not have lard. And they would cook with lard or they, for the servants. Uh, and so that they wouldn't suspect and, would, and, was, and so they would have what was regular and they would cook without pork very often for themselves. Sometimes I have to tell you, there were couples that did not observe together so that there was, There'd be women who they would use that basically we're talking about a bowl and a mug, you know, um, and a spoon and a knife. I mean, that's all. Uh, and uh, but that they, they were they would cook for themselves and they would have their husband would be served on the same uh, the, the same dishes that had to, that, that the servants were eating from. Uh, there's in one in one document, there was a, um, a, a, a couple that did not observe together. Uh, and uh, the neighbor would come in and he would say, come in, you know, join us to eat. We have some delicious wild boar. Uh, and, and she would say, you know, no, no, thank you. No, thank you. And her husband, and, and this was in an inquisition document. And the husband says, you know, uh, you know, come dear, come dear. You know, you, you, you don't, you don't want to look for trouble. And she said, don't worry, trouble will come on its own. And there she was tried by the inquisition and she was truly in trouble. Um, then we have to look at other things that would be observed, uh, fasts and holidays. Um, Yom Kippur was remembered. Yom Kippur is, is sort of the raison d'etre for the, for the Judaizers. Um, it had a special significance. It had psychological repercussions. They identified with the people of Israel. It, it gave them the opportunity to feel that they could be saved that this was a day of salvation, that maybe 364 days I wasn't able to be a good Jew, but if I fast on this day, God will forgive me and I can be saved. Um, in the very early years, a few of them remembered some of the prayers for Slichot, that sort of falls by the wayside. Many of them do ask each other and ask their loved ones for forgiveness. They go barefoot because you're not allowed to wear or use leather, so they just take off their, their, their shoes. Um, and it's interesting that most of them, after the after the fast, they eat a, a, ate a meat meal that was, you know, <laughs> New York Jews eat bagels, cream cheese, and lox. Uh, and uh, but here they were eating, uh, you know, a meat be meal. What was also interesting is that we find other fasts pop up, uh, and these were traditional fasts on Mondays and Thursdays. Now Mondays and Thursdays were chosen by in in Talmudic time as the days to fast when if there was a drought and, and, they, and they were worried that you know, we, we have not been righteous and we need to do something, they would be just from sunrise to sunset. They were not by like Yom Kippur or Tisha B'Av. They were just sunrise to sunset fast. Uh, and they were on the Torah reading days on Mondays and Thursdays. Now we find these fasts come into, into the Inquisition documents as of 1499-1500 because there was a young woman named Ines de Herrera, who was a 12 year old girl who started having visions. And she was encouraging everyone to fast that they all would be going to the Holy Land uh, and didn't want to wait for Yom Kippur because that would be you know, too many months to wait. And they were and, and encouraging them to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. And we find, uh, we find a lot of case, uh, cases there. Uh, other holidays, well, We've got um, Passover, the symbol of freedom, which is around the corner now that Purim is behind us. Uh, and um, in the early years, we do have, uh, I found some very full descriptions of a Seder. 
um, of other people who had been there who were servants who described on the table from A to Z, I mean, parsley and matzah and, 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 and bitter and salt water, you know, right, right, really right down uh, to the very last detail. Um, but as, as time goes on, this becomes much more difficult, although they do remember matzah, uh, and anyone who knows about the Jews of Belmonte sees that it means in Portugal, that's something that was carried on to right through the 20th century. Um, and my, and before, the, before the expulsion, then we have them sometimes uh, either buying or just asking Jews for matzah. And uh, another heartbreaking uh, trial that I saw uh, was of a young girl who had gotten matzah and she put it in her apron and she folded in her apron and she was running through the, um, the center of town. And as she's running by, she slips and it falls out in front of the priest. And this was very sad indeed. Um, the, um, I think also one of the most creative uh, crypto Jewish women that I saw was a woman who um, was, basically wanted to have a new set, a different set of dishes for Pesach, but she didn't have or couldn't say, go, you know, go up, go up to the attic and take down my, my Passover dishes. Uh, and as of Purim, she started becoming very clumsy and she would be eating and then accidentally drop her plate. And then she would send her maidservant out to the, um, uh, to the, the uh, cer ceramicist and order a new plate for her and put it on the side. And then she'd accidentally drop her mug. And then she'd accidentally, and by, by Pesach, and she had a month to do this in exactly, she had a new set of dishes. Um, I'm not recommending this technique. Uh, it's obviously extremely expensive as well. And what it also tells us that this woman had money because she couldn't just have done it if she were, um, you know, uh, uh, if she were counting her, her, uh, her, her pennies. Um, so we do have them trying uh, to kosher their utensils if they can. Um, it's it's again something that doesn't. As the years go on, we see it, it we see it less and less. At least in Castile, um, and and as I say, many things disappear. Uh, Sukkot, as I mentioned, now Purim is a big problem because everyone asks me, what about you know, uh, Queen Esther? And there she was, the prototype or uh, the heroine with the hidden identity, just like all the crypto Jewish women and not selling, telling anyone about it. Um, I, in, I, I, I examined all the women's files from the beginning of the establishment of the Inquisition in 1491 until 1580. And, and nobody, I think maybe once Esther was mentioned in passing, um, in later in Portugal, she comes up from the Spanish Jews who went over in 1492 because they knew the knew, knew halacha much better, uh, I guess. But it doesn't it, it really doesn't doesn't show up, um, unfortunately. Um, and the last set of customs that I want to talk about uh, are related to the life cycle. And these uh, divide I divide into birth and purity rites and death rituals. Um, now here, again, I will talk, I talked about that there are things that disappear and that there are things that are added. So here I've got some treats. All right. The um, first is the, of birth rights, uh, of birth right, R-I-T-E, not birthright, um, is called hadas, with an H, hadas, which is from the Latin, Latin word for fate. Uh, and this is really interesting. This is a right that was a medieval Spanish tradition that everybody did, Jews and non-Jews did. In like the 10th century, 11th century, they, they were having basically a celebration upon the birth of a child, male or female, egalitarian. And it was often at the end of a week um, and the baby would be dressed in white and there'd be fruit served and they'd be singing. Sometimes there'd be tambourine accompaniment. Well, for some, reason that is inexplicable to me. I, I actually published an article in Spanish about, about this. Um, the, it was only the Jews who continued it. So that by the 15th century, you know, pr prior to the Inquisition, we have the Jews who are, are still having hadas, but the Christians are not. 
And the, so we find that many of the crypto Jews are observing the Hadas. And even before 1492, they're inviting Jews to their parties, um, vice versa. Uh, and, and I will say that this tradition continues with the Sephardim who leave. In other words, I know that when I was um, uh, talking to a colleague of mine who's, got, who's in Istanbul, one of the, song, the, the um, singing groups, and I said to her, you know, there, there's a lovely traditional song for, uh, for Saturday night, Shavuot Tov, uh, in Ladino. And, uh, you know, it's called Un Buen Semana, uh, Shavuot Tov. And they talk about, you know, the, the new week and what are we going to do in the new week? And there's a wonderful line there, which is, in order to do the fadas and to circumcise our children. And so still, still in 20th century Turkey and the Balkans, they were still doing these hadas. Uh, so this is very interesting because no rabbi would ever find it in any list of in the Shulchan Aruch or anywhere. And here they are doing this. Uh, and again, realize that for the Inquisition, this is Jewish. It doesn't matter. It's the Jews who were doing it and it's the crypto Jews who were doing it. Um, we also find something else, another addition called, and they literally use this term in Spanish, debaptizing. Uh, and you can't debaptize. I mean, according to the, the according to the church, baptism is irrevocable. Once it's done, nothing you can do about it. You, it's it's a fait accompli. But for these crypto Jews, some of them, after bringing their babies home from the baptismal font. They would wash, try to wash off the chrism, wash off the, the oils. And this was psychological. Obviously, this was, a, it was an act of rebellion to say, we're not accepting this. But of course, they were still, they were still Catholic, uh, but they were trying to do this uh, as a way to, to make a statement for them. Um, other purity laws, well, uh, we do find crypto Jewish women who are bathing. Uh, after menstruation, after childbirth. Uh, and we realize that this is not necessarily something that's being done by all the women, even though it seems odd to us modern people uh, that, that this is what was done. Uh, and we have a problem because there's no mikvah so that anything that has to be done, it has to be, you know, there, were in the, there were a few homes that had water in their basements and they tried to do some semblance of bathing in it, but it sort of falls by the wayside. Okay, the last group of, um, uh, of observances or death rituals, and here we have a tremendous combination of halachic, of, of Jewish law, uh, and as well as superstitious observances. Um, we have them, when uh, someone would die in a home, they, were, they tended to pour out the water from all the utensils in the house. Um, they were um, they said they were doing this to, and again, we don't have running water. So you've got all the time, you've got pitchers and things in the house. So that if you, if you need the water, you don't have to go in and out hundreds of times a day. Uh, they said they were doing this one to announce the death in the home, that people would know that, that this was a sign to warn, one of them said, and this is sort of unusual, to warn the Kohen, because the Kohen can't be there uh, around, uh, that they warned that there was someone who had passed away. Some said this was a sign of the soul pouring out. Uh, and and it, one lovely superstition was that the angel of death has to clean his sword, but if there's no water, then he can't get to his next victim. Um, we have sort of burial societies. It's usually women who are bathing the dead. It's the women who are sewing the shroud. Um, and I also know from some of my colleagues that there were converso burial societies uh, later, even when they, they're being buried in Catholic graveyards, they, this is a big problem. There's no, what graveyard can they use? They have to use a Catholic graveyard with the cross there, but they're at least try, trying to prepare them as, as well as they can. Um, some of them are putting a pillow with earth underneath the head of the deceased. Um, this was so that they would be forgiven their sins. This is what they said. Um, they were covering their wells upon a birth, uh, excuse me, death. Um, also, they would say this was to prevent the soul of the dead from bathing in it. They were putting uh, an el nishama, a candle for the soul in the room where the dead uh, had, had slept, uh, and also a glass of water for his or her soul. They are sitting Shiva. They are sitting Shiva. Um, 
they are, I mean, there are priests who talked about how weird it was because they would call it having uh, one door open, one door closed. You know, in, when, when in a shiver home, the door is not supposed to be locked. You're not supposed to be knocking or ringing uh, a doorbell. You're supposed to just walk in because they're not, it's not supposed to be an everyday activity to say, hi, come on in, and, and not to say, hi, how you doing? Uh, and, and they would notice that they would have a, a door. The doors were set oddly. Um, we have them uh, sitting there. We have them having, uh, after the burial, they're having a meal. The meal will be often with fish, uh, with lentils. The meal was a cojerso, uh, with lentils, with eggs, things they said that had no mouths, uh, like the mourners who aren't supposed to, sp to, to, to speak, um, or the cycle of life. They're sitting at very low tables. And then something very interesting here we find is called the babillera. And those of you who know Spanish, here barba, beard. Uh, and this is basically a bandage that's wrapped around the chin. It's not a, it's not a, a real beard, but it's a bandage that's, wrap, that's wrapped around the chin to keep one's mouth closed. Now, of course, you're saying whose mouth is supposed to be closed. Now, some of them actually put the barriera around the deceased to keep the soul in. But what I found much more common was that the mourners had the barbillera again, so that they would not be that they would be sad. They would not talk about uh, everyday activities and, mon and mundane things. Uh, we have them coming to comfort the mourners. We have women who are professional keeners, who know dirges, and you know they're coming and they're wailing. And I found sometimes see some of, some of the servants even had heard what these uh, the dirges were. So from all that I've described to you uh, in what, you know, if, as quickly as I could, what can we learn? Well, the role of women was essential for the continuation of the observance of this crypto Jewish world. As I said, the women were usually teachers. There were more women during the hundred years that I examined, there were more women than men who were brought in by the inquisition. Um, some observed with their husbands, some observed without their husbands. They were truly the main perpetuators of the tradition. Now they vary in observance. I mean, I described um, you know, many, many scores of observances here. I can't, did not find one woman who, who observed everything, but some of them really had a fairly full, uh, a, a full Jewish life, underground life to the best of their the best of their ability. And some of them just observed Yom Kippur. Or the, or the Sabbath, or you know, something something small and and symbolic for them. Um, but here, and what what we need to know is that the Inquisition was concerned with two things: with the deed, with what you've done, and that's why we have a list of charges in the ac accusation and descriptions. But also the intention, so that if you had if you debaptized your child, if you had hadas. Um, if you knew, if you did, if you did other things that you thought were were halachic, then that to them was on the same, absolutely on the same level as the observance. It was, it was, her, it was heresy, and for heresy, you had, your soul was in in deep, deep danger, in serious danger. So, despite the risk involved, these crypto Jewish women, the ones in these files that I found, remained loyal to Judaism. They risked their lives. And they maintained a commitment to their ancestral religion and identified with and preserved their heritage. Wow. Thank you, Renee. Thank you for the comprehensive, mesmerizing presentation, shedding much needed light on this important segment of Jewish and world history. So finally, I would like to take this opportunity and thank our global friends and partners for their amazing support in making our work possible. Thank you all. I'd like to close where I began. The Sfarad segment of Jewish history did not and does not have the same coverage or attention as European biblical Jewry. We invite you to learn more about the silent but rich, <clears throat> profound segment of Jewish heritage. Please join us on our upcoming webinars and follow us online. Thank you for making this event a success. See you next time and bye for now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.